panelists for joining us uh, this morning uh, or this afternoon or evening, uh, depending on your time zone. Um, the interest group on international courts and tribunals, as Wes mentioned, uh, focuses on the work of the many existing and proposed international judicial and arbitral bodies. But in response to feedback that the advisory board received, we wanted to offer a panel event that has a slightly broader scope, both in terms of modalities of dispute resolution and perhaps certain uh, regions of the world which might reflect um, effective use of those modalities. And for the purposes of this discussion, we're blessed and honored to have uh, Dr. Brian McGarry as our moderator. I'll just briefly introduce him and then give him the floor. Um, Dr. McGarry is Assistant Professor of Public International Law at Leiden University, as well as a visiting professor at the Sciences Po Law School. Um, his experience includes assisting tribunals and advising governments and international intergovernmental organizations in international legal matters. And he's, uh, for example, principal investigator at the Tracing Inherent Powers Project. Uh, he regularly contributes to international law capacity building programs and is both an alumnus and former lecturer uh, with the MIDS LLM program. Uh, Brian, over to you and thank you again. Well, thank you, Philip, and, and congratulations to you for, for putting the work into organizing such a, an ambitious and diverse panel. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I want to thank Wes as well, uh, Freya and Massimo, the co-chairs of this group, uh, and our wonderful panelists and all of you for joining today. Um, we are gathered here today, dearly beloved, to discuss international dispute settlement outside of the courts and beyond, quote, the usual suspects. So on the one hand, at its most basic, this is an opportunity for everyone here uh, to familiarize ourselves with non-judicial, non-arbitral dispute settlement in four distinct systems very efficiently, thanks to our experts who have graciously donated their time today. Um, and in so doing, we will naturally draw comparisons and contrasts. But our higher purpose today, so to speak, is to query in this process the potential role of non-judicial settlement and the potential lessons of these four institutions' experience in the establishment and reform of other international dispute settlement systems? What are the benefits and disadvantages of varying levels of judicialization or institutionalization when designing mechanisms for resolving disputes? And should we temper our ambition to universalize the experience of these four institutions in light of what we might call regional or other distinct approaches to institution building and dispute settlement. In order to try to strike this balance, I'm going to introduce each speaker's topic with a couple prompts that may help us to tie it all together. They'll each have 10 minutes to give an overview of their respective systems, at which point I'll interrupt with some follow-up prompts allowing for up to five minutes of response. At the end, if, if I do my job right, we'll have time for discussion involving all four panelists for whom I would ask, uh, as Wes noted, our audience members to begin posting questions to the chat box throughout our time today. Um, and so first up in, in the, the sequence that, that I, I'd like to discuss these, if I have my, my will here, would be, would be Mushek. Uh, Mushek Manikyan, uh, who manages the mediation unit of the Office of the Ombudsman of the United Nations Funds and Programs, and who in that capacity is responsible for building and overseeing the global mediation panel. He's an international attorney, a mediation pioneer, arbitration counsel, and before his time at the UN, he served as a mediator at the DC Court of Appeals and the World Bank Group's compliance advisor ombudsman, and focused on encouraging mediation globally, especially in the context of investor state dispute settlement. So Mushak, thank you so much for, for joining us today to discuss a talk that you've, you've tentatively titled as mediation as an effective mechanism to resolve workplace disputes in the United Nations. Um, and so when you take 10 minutes now to, to help those of us who are not intimately familiar with this system to, to understand what you consider to be of broader value from it, I'm particularly curious when we talk about things like ombudsman procedures and good offices, are these effective in practice? Do they provide a model for uh, organizations outside of the UN system? Do they borrow from established practices elsewhere? And ultimately, what are the challenges for UN mediation as you see it as an effective system of dispute settlement? So Mushak, thank you very much for, for taking 10 minutes with us now. Thank you very much, Brian. And I want to thank you also, Philip, and all the organizers and for inviting me. I'm very delighted to actually speak about my favorite topic, which is mediation. And sometimes my, my wife jokes and says, oh, you have two wives 
Uh, one is mediation and it's the second is me and it's still unclear which one is the favorite wife. Um, so I hope at the end of this session, you will, you will understand that, you know, I have some preferences as well there. Um, so thank you all for joining. Um, and I want to first um, speak about how our system works. And I think as, as Brian, you prompted me to speak about the system in general, how the UN workplace dispute settlement works in the UN. Um, so in, in the funds and programs, which includes five agencies. So basically our office, the office of the Ombudsman for the funds and programs, it includes five agencies. Those are UNICEF, UNDP, UNOPS, UNFPA, and UN Women. About 80,000 people are supported by our office. And that includes staff, consultants, interns, volunteers, you name it. Um, so the way how it works, our office is a kind of an informal, confidential, and neutral mechanism to resolve conflicts before, hopefully, before people go to formal. And the way the formal works, there are many mechanisms in the UN system um, when what we call it a formal and the major ones are investigation and the UN tribunal. Um, and what, what I mean by investigation and UN tribunal, there's a specific tribunal in the UN, uh, which is called the UN dispute tribunal. And it has the second layer, a UN appeals tribunal, which actually handles all international administrative cases. And basically if I'm an employee, I wanna sue my organization because of the unfair treatment, I can do it and challenge um, the administrative decision in the tribunal. Um, and there are many others, like if I'm facing um, abuse of authority or I'm facing harassment or sexual harassment, I can report that in the investigation. But we're hoping that, and also the organizations are creating those ombuds mechanisms that before even considering the formal mechanism, people will consider going to the informal to save time, resources, money, and emotions and all kinds of things that you might think about. Now, <clears throat> you asked um, Brian whether this, this system is effective and I can speak to um, the effectiveness of the mediation program in our office. The office of the ombudsman has two kind of a major pillars, one in the ombud service and the other one um, is the mediation service which I lead. Um, so we track our, you know, our services, we track the quality and we report um, at this point of last year, we had about 94% of a success rate and 92% of satisfaction rate. And that we ask um, you know, each individual who participates in the mediation process. Those are employees, as I mentioned. So I, I, can, have a, I can have a problem with my supervisor. Let's say Diane is my supervisor and I'm not able to get along with Diane. I can actually request support from our office to mediate the dispute. And it happens almost all the time but 52% of our cases are supervisee, supervisor. There are some cases where people litigate against their organization. If I'm treated unfairly or if I'm, my post has been moved from one place or another, I think it's unfair because my supervisor is retaliating against me. I can again request mediation uh, for that purpose and not to go to the tribunal. And then the last kind of a category of the disputes that we handle is the consultants, so to say known staff. Um, whose contracts um, are subject to arbitration. And unfortunately, consultants and interns and volunteers, so anybody who is a known employee from a UN technical perspective, they don't have access to the tribunal. They don't have access to free legal services. There's another office that provides free legal services. They don't have that, unfortunately. So the only opportunity for them to go to formal resolution is arbitration. And that's where we are again, hoping that people will consider mediation, which is free to anyone, regardless of their contract, um, before going to pay for an arbitrator or pay for the lawyer to represent themselves. Um, so that's how, how the system works um, in terms of, and about 10 or 12%, depending on a year, it's, um, it, those are the cases that involve um, you know, consultants, volunteers, no staff, so kind of a pre-arbitration cases. And, and you asked also, I just want to spend about two minutes also about the challenges that we see uh, with regards to UN mediation. Um, so the one, I think I would just put into three buckets. One challenge that I see is to how we can make mediation as a mainstream. And, and that's, a, that's a challenge across the board in the UN because there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of rules, 
that encourage mediation. There are a lot of rules that encourage informal resolution, but in reality, it's very difficult to convince people, to convince colleagues to speak up, to put together some mechanism and tools so they are not afraid of raising their concern about their supervisors or about the organization because they think, well, my contract is for one year. If I raise a concern, maybe there is a potential that my contract will not be renewed. So there's a valid concern. Of course, there are rules to protect people, but still with all the protections, in reality, people um, have that concern. So, so that's one, one kind of a challenge that we're um, trying to address it. The next challenge is, I think, especially in light of the Zoom mediations, that almost about 90% of our mediations are Zoom over Zoom, um, the, how you protect the confidentiality. And, and that's kind of a, has been a kind of a tricky thing for us because you never know, right? People can record sessions or, um, or even if they don't record, they can speak to their colleagues. Um, even if the rules say, yeah, you have to protect the confidentiality, but you know, um, it, it's nothing, there's no remedy against the disclosure of the confidentiality, except if you go to the tribunal, of course. So the final, um, final kind of um, um, challenge for us is to always educate colleagues that is um, mediation is a voluntary and informal resolution. And a lot of times people think, oh, when I'm going to a mediation, I'm actually reporting Brian, I'm reporting Mushek, I'm reporting Tara. That's not what we want to see. We want to see that people think that it's an informal resolution. There's no reporting. It's in fact, it's a de-escalation of the matter. And we want them to see that it's a dialogue, an opportunity for them to receive support and use that support mechanism to resolve their conflict in a the, in the dialogue. Unfortunately, in reality, people still um, view ombudsman uh, kind of services as, as something like a complaint mechanism. And we want to change that mindset as well. So let me stop here and, and see if you have any further questions, Brian, um, and I'll go from there. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, thanks very much, Mushak. That was that was a concise summary, and and there's a few points here that I've put off to the side because I suspect we'll be able to tie them in um, when when our colleagues have spoken on their respective systems. Uh, for now, I, I I note that you had discussed um, in the preparation for this that you saw that there there may be some benefits to having unsettled mediations, which I find. Um, a little counterintuitive. So I was hoping that you could elaborate that because I think it might also lead us in a promising direction. Right. No, thank you for that. I think it's a it's a great question that a lot of times lawyers struggle um, in terms, or even parties struggle. It's like, what if I lose time? What if I go and have a bad experience in mediation and I don't settle the case? You know, it essentially means I've lost maybe a couple of months or weeks um, or sometimes days in our context. Um, but I think there's a still a lot of value um, if you have an unsettled case. And there, um, there are a number of those. And I want to touch upon um, some of the things that we have seen. So one value is um, in the UN context, particularly, and which is actually true in commercial investor state mediations as well. A lot of times people need some sort of a safe space to tell their story. Um, we, we see you know, many times when people start their litigation in the UN, or against like complain against their supervisors, um, they are doing it because they are not heard. And mediation, they, um, it gives them an opportunity to be heard. And even if you don't settle the case, that it, um, you know, just the opportunity that you have that chance to tell your story without any constraints, without any limits, that gives them a bit more satisfaction of the process. The second thing I think that is really important, um, if you if you have an unsettled case, if let's say it's a pre-arbitration case or a pre-litigation case, most of the context that we see, it's at least that I do most of the cases, is, is a pre-arbitration, pre-litigation um, cases. Um, and those are really great when you see the both parties. And parties would sometimes would say, well, I want to have that opportunity. Um, and the lawyers would say, oh, I want to have the opportunity to hear the other lawyers perspective. And that's a really you know, great space, for confidential space, for them to exchange ideas and to see the other lawyer's strategy, to, um, to strategize, even if, you, if the case doesn't sell, strategize what's going to be your strategy in litigation and arbitration. Of course, I hope 
mediation is not used for that purpose because that will be, um, to me, not fair. But I think even if the case doesn't settle, you, you are better equipped to understand what to expect in litigation or arbitration. And the final thing that I would say um, with regards to unsettled cases, there's a statistic that about 18% of cases settle after, so to say, unsettled mediation. And the, and the way how they settle is through a very careful and diligent follow-up by the mediator. So if you have a if you have an experienced mediator who understands how to carefully and diligently follow up with the parties, you might have you might fall into this bucket of an eighteen percent. And I've had so many cases where you might think, oh, it, it just doesn't sell. This case is just useless um, for for mediation. But after a while, things change. After a while, people change their perspective. They talk to their wives. They talk to their husbands. Um, you know, the mortgage rates go up and low and, and all kinds of things. Then people need money or, you know, perspectives are now different in light of certain changes in life. So that makes you in a better position, even if you had the unsettled case, just because you have developed a trust and connection with the party as a mediator that gives you better opportunities to settle the case afterwards. Um, so let me stop here and, and see if you have any other questions there. Thanks very much. That was that was quite illuminating. I do have, uh, and we have time for uh, at least one more question from me before we open it up to to our colleagues. Um, we are speaking of an administrative system, and you're raving uh, with with support. You're raving about the success and the satisfaction rate of this system. Um, I'm I'm just curious whether you think when we're building or when we're reforming international judicial or arbitral institutions uh, other than an administrative tribunal like the UN tribunal, is there room, is there value in including one way or the other, this kind of um, required or preferential mediation um, uh, at the international level? Do, do you think that there are lessons that can be extrapolated from this, again, workplace system to non-workplace disputes? Yeah. Uh, that's a great question, Brian, and, and thanks for bringing it up. And I think you already suggested that I'm uh, I'm biased indeed, that because of my my love to mediation, and I would say indeed every system, if you don't have a mediation system in place, along with other things, of course, I, I'm not suggesting that every case is good for mediation. By the way, um, there are some systems, there are some cases that would benefit from litigation, and we clearly tell the parties when they are going through an intake process with us to evaluate whether the mediation would be a good case for a uh, good process for their case. We always we're very frank with them. If we believe that it's not a good me case for mediation, we'll tell them. But I think from an institutional perspective, if we're thinking, is it a good idea to put together, if I'm an arbitration center, or if I'm an institutional institution that handles, you know, adjudicates cases, is it a good idea to include mediation as an option? I would say 100%. And I think if, you, if we are not having that, we're losing that opportunity to at least have some cases settled quickly. And secondly, there are some cases that if you provide that space for dialogue, it open, opens up so many doors uh, for settlement opportunities. And I know that there are some lawyers who maybe have had bad experience in mediation because of you know, not great mediators and, and all kinds of things. But um, once you have one great experience in mediation, then I've seen lawyers who change their strategy to say, oh, I was 100% an arbitration lawyer. Now I'm, I'm doing 20% mediation cases. Not as a mediator necessarily, as a mediation advocate. And it's a different kind of a beast that you can master as, as a lawyer, which is really great thing if you, if you do that. But also this... There's one thing that I would say about incorporating mediation into your system. I've Very seen, quickly. Yes, uh, and I've seen I've seen many um, cases when you give that tool to lawyers, they become much more effective in litigation as well. In the UN context, at least that's the case. And I see now there are a lot of lawyers in the UN who represent organizations or staff. They get mediation advocacy training, which I would I would love to see if you have a mediation program within any adjudication system. Or 
Okay, thank you so much for this uh, expert perspective, Mushek. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, again, trying to tie, uh, in the spirit of my last question, to tie some of these experiences and values to the other systems that we're going to discuss, starting now uh, with Professor Diane Desierto uh, from the University of Notre Dame Law School. Um, she is a professor of law and director of the LLM faculty there, also has a joint appointment at the Kiosk School of Global Affairs, she, uh, as many of you know, teaches, publishes, and practices in the areas of international law and human rights, international economic law and development, arbitration, maritime security, uh, comparative public law, and of course, the focus of our discussion today, ASEAN. Uh, so, uh, Professor Desierto, thank you so much for joining us. The, the draft title of the brief intervention um, that you've uh, proposed is Dispute Resolution Beyond Adjudication, Negotiations, Mediation, and Conciliation in ASEAN. And so on the one hand, um, when we when we learn about this system through your expertise, I'm, I'm interested in hearing, again, the whether you would take the same tone uh, with respect to the use of good offices and um, uh, uh, mediation and consultation under the uh, ASEAN system in the same way that we've heard uh, rave reviews of this in the UN system. Uh, is, it, is it a similarly bright experience under ASEAN and how does that compare or retain aspects of dispute settlement region in the dispute settlement in the Southeast Asian region uh, preceding ASEAN? So, so what, what informs the region's preference for these uh, mechanisms and are they, in your view, successful? Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Brian, and thank you to the fellow panelists as well as to the American Society of the International Law for the opportunity for my 10 minutes to discuss the idiosyncratic preferences of Southeast Asia for a wide range of dispute settlement mechanisms. One has to understand first and foremost that the region itself is by its very nature diverse in multiple aspects, regionally, linguistically, historically, geographically, it is a very much a maritime region, politically, as well as in its own um, democratic and varying shades of democracy and authoritarianism within a region as complex as Southeast Asia. From its inception as an association of Southeast Asian nations under the 1967 Bangkok Declaration, the goal in 1967 in the light of glaring interstate disputes between the original ASEAN five member states, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand, and Singapore. The goal was to promote regional peace and stability through rule of law in the relationship of countries in this region, which is why the very first binding international law that comes out of this region actually is the 1976 Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in Southeast Asia. And curiously, the preference in this treaty is for the settlement of disputes likely to disturb regional peace and harmony from uh, will be settled through friendly negotiations and without reference to any threat or use of force. That's quite understandable given the historical and geopolitical context at the time. But what was also quite interesting was that the institutionalization of friendly offices of negotiations and conciliation dates all the way back to this 1976 treaty. It would be followed later on where the references in subsequent instruments before ASEAN was created as an intergovernmental or rather recognized as an intergovernmental organization with legal personality under the 2008 charter of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. We find that in economic disputes, there were more treaties and instruments that focused on ASEAN economic cooperation and dispute settlement officially through consultations good offices, conciliation, mediation, the administrative role of the ASEAN senior economic officials meetings that can establish panels and provide for certain trade remedies such as compensation and suspension of concessions. There was subsequently in 2004, the Vientiane Protocol on Enhanced Dispute Settlement that again refers to a specific list of economic agreements within ASEAN, which is administered for the senior economic officials meeting, but this time around expands the suite of non-adjudication dispute resolution mechanisms, apart from consultations, good offices, conciliation and mediation, 
activates the role of the ASEAN Secretary General as sort of the hub under which these mechanisms could be administered. And then if those processes could not resolve disputes, the senior economic officials meeting could then establish panels and the ASEAN economic ministers at a higher level could also supposedly establish an appellate body. This was never actually established within the region, even within the ASEAN economic community under the charter of the ASEAN. So we find that the default dispute resolution mechanism within Southeast Asia before ASEAN was already non-adjudicative. And there's a historical basis for this, given the linguistic diversity, the inherent political, economic, cultural diversity of nations, the way to build confidence and trust was not necessarily to submit to a binding adjudication, but to enable all parties to work out differences as possible through good offices, conciliation, or mediation mechanisms. It also provided a lot of flexibility for the political resolution of disputes rather than the formalized legal resolution of disputes that has its upsides, but as well as its downsides. We see this in dispute settlement under the charter-based ASEAN, where in the charter itself, it instantiates the same adherence to principles of democracy, rule of law, good governance, the respect for and protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms. And then among its principles emphasizes that there must be reliance on peaceful settlement of disputes. Now, one thing that is distinct that perhaps not a lot of people understand about the Association of Southeast Asian Nations is that there are core obligations for the member states. The core obligation is under Article 5, Paragraph 2 of the Charter, which says that every member state, all member states have to take, and I quote, all necessary measures that includes the enactment of appropriate domestic legislation to effectively implement the provisions of the ASEAN Charter and to comply with all obligations of membership. If there is a serious breach of the ASEAN Charter or there's any non-compliance, then the matter is actually referred to dispute settlement under Article 20 of that Charter. Now, in the specific regional environment of ASEAN, decision-making historically has been based on consultation and consensus. There was a slight softening to this principle under Article 20, Paragraph 2 of the Charter, which said that if consensus cannot be achieved at the level of the heads of state, the ASEAN summit, then the ASEAN summit can decide how that specific decision can be made. So far, until 2022, there has not been a situation where consensus has not been achieved and this, this provision has not yet been triggered under the charter-based ASEAN. In case of a serious breach of the charter and non-compliance, the reference or rather the dispute settlement mechanism is ultimately again political because the matter is to be referred to the ASEAN summit, the highest governing body of the region for decision. And in the settlement of disputes, even in the structure of settlement of disputes and as provided for under the charter, the emphasis again is on dialogue, consultation, negotiation, and the specialized dispute settlement mechanisms that are designed across the three pillars, within and across the three pillars of ASEAN cooperation, whether it's the economic community, the political community, or the sociocultural community. So one would think that there is a structure, and in fact, there's also a stronger role for the chair of the ASEAN, since it's a rotating chairmanship every year among the 10 member states, there's a stronger role for both the ASEAN chair as well as the ASEAN secretary general to perform good office roles in crisis situations. This has had variable results. What's the track record perhaps so that um, we can go more quickly towards an evaluation of the appropriateness of these non-adjudicative dispute resolution mechanisms. Again, as I said, when we were looking at regional geopolitical conflicts and, arm, and challenges that involved armed conflicts involving the original ASEAN 5. The pre-ASEAN um, charter era showed that constructive engagement and negotiations between the original ASEAN 5, Malaysia, the Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, and Singapore, those modalities worked generally to diffuse tensions in the region and to avoid all-out war. 
that has not been the case when it came to regional geopolitical conflicts and challenges involving the newer members, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and Myanmar, when there have been political disputes or political social economic disputes involving these countries. So much of this has been referred to the ASEAN Regional Forum for generally track one dialogues with ASEAN's external partners, including the United States, including China, including Australia, New Zealand, the UK, among others. There has been, insofar as these political disputes are concerned, some regional containment has largely been achieved, but as to whether or not that is settlement of the dispute is another question. One can only point to the, the very glaring example of the South China Sea disputes, in particular the territorial maritime claims of countries that have not yet been settled through negotiation and the different tracks that have been taken by different member states in regard to how they will enforce their respective claims. Indonesia decides it's going to burn boats that enter its territorial waters. The Philippines decides to go to arbitration on its own. Um, there's, stall, there's a stalling of the South China Sea code of conduct. There have been protracted negotiations. So one can say that the record is a little bit checkered in terms of reaching a regional resolution of political disputes as of this time. At best, it has been containment, but we have not seen lasting dispute settlement of these political claims. The record is somewhat more positive when we take a look at the economic community. Now, the economic community has more or less, through regional treaties, standardized dispute resolution practices and has always instantiated prior resort to conciliation negotiations, good offices, referrals to the ASEAN Protocol on Enhanced Dispute Settlement Mechanism before there's any resort to binding adjudication through either our binding international arbitration or resort to national court litigation. There is no regional court. The ASEAN Senior Economic Officials Meeting also has quite a central and probably underestimated for external observers. It actually has a very central role in the informal settlement of disputes, ministry to ministry. And so to a large extent, when it involved cross-border projects, the ASEAN Senior Economic Officials has helped pave the way for um, better adjustments of expectations between the parties ultimately leading, if not to um, a temporary peaceful impasse, outright resolution um, facilitated by the ministers themselves. The political security community, on the other hand, which has disputes that are referred to the ASEAN Regional Forum, the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting, the ASEAN Law Ministers Meeting, the ASEAN Foreign Ministers Meeting, the ASEAN Chair and or the ASEAN Summit, has been a little bit more difficult to see active resolution of disputes. And partly it is simply that we are, the ASEAN by itself is a very horizontal organization. We operate by meetings not through standing organizations. You've got about 1,600 to 1,800 meetings now that are taking place in coordination at an administrative level as the major challenge. So we see when there are different South China Sea, West Philippine Sea incidents, whether they are maritime incursions or island building or any of these environmental issues, they are dealt with piecemeal. When there was the 2020 takeover by the Myanmar military junta, when there were political and constitutional upheavals in Thailand and protests, when there were issues, peace and security issues, these are often dealt with out of the shadow of public scrutiny. So to the extent that the larger public of Southeast Asia is unaware of what takes place at these fora, there's largely a difficult sense of extracting some degree of accountable transparency in following how these disputes are being settled or not. And finally, with respect to ASEAN sociocultural community dispute management, out of the three pillars, the sociocultural community is the most thinly resourced materially, as well as logistically, as well as in terms of human resources. There are very limited mandates at the regional level for the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. And this area is often delegated to national jurisdictions, especially if these are human rights issues, even if they may have regional impacts. This is why ultimately what I say here, at least to conclude, is that the quandary for the non-adjudicative dispute settlement 
having long been the default modes of dispute settlement in Southeast Asia for about half a century, is that we now have regional challenges that intensify a dispute settlement needs beyond national borders. And thus, when you see cross-border environmental crises, climate disasters, marine environmental protection, cross-border investment infrastructure projects that have regional impacts, regional migration and displacement as a result of national government ASEAN member state policies, as we see from the Rohingya diaspora throughout the region, and the challenges of cross-border coordination for pandemics and health and safety issues, whether they be in aviation and trade and health responses, the transparency of information, one finds that there is a glacial turn towards increasing adjudication in ASEAN because of the impasse that we're seeing at the regional level. To a certain extent, perhaps to differentiate what uh, my presentation from Mushek's enthusiasm for mediation, we are very enthusiastic about mediation in Southeast Asia, but at this point, it depends on the nature of the dispute, the parties involved, and the kind of outcomes that we seek to realize. And so to that respect, you find incredible diversity in its resort to non-adjudicative as well as adjudicative mechanisms in ASEAN. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. That, that was fascinating um, in terms of the bits of history of the organization and the ins and outs that uh, would take us each a lot longer to learn without your expertise. Um, I think that the, the most striking way that you've, you've framed it here uh, in the spirit of our opening query as to whether there are regional distinctions um, is, is perhaps a limitation of ambition, that, that this is a, an organization which has by and large been aimed at containment, not, um, not doing more than that necessarily, a more piecemeal administrative situation as you've described. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested when we turn to Anderson about his view on your remarks, your, your sort of linguistic theory of this, the idea that more uh, fragmented linguistic regions uh, may be less inclined or less amenable to uh, international judicial systems uh, within their international organizations. Um, I find that quite interesting. What I want to ask you, uh, since you, before we turn to, to Anderson, what I want to ask you is, you've talked about the, the lack of, or apparent lack of transparency uh, in aspects of this system, and, and some other, I think, sober assessments um, that would call into question whether this is a reflection of what we might call universal values of international dispute settlement, the kinds of things that we would want to bear in mind when we're building systems elsewhere that are uh, perhaps in a different region or not of a regional nature. So when we talk about things like efficiency, when we talk about things like predictability in international dispute settlement, what values along those lines, Diane, could you, could you in your view, say ASEAN does well and should be seen as a model of? I mean, to the extent that there is already a deep sense of the diversity of the region and its approaches to dispute settlement, you see that reflected all throughout and in fact, even insisted in the language of the charter and the creation and structure of the organization. But the perennial challenge that ASEAN is facing now is its own ambition towards what we call ASEAN centrality, that all actions and activities of ASEAN, including dispute settlement and dispute resolution must be people-centered. It must have the welfare of the 600 million plus people of ASEAN foremost in its, in, in its sites. The challenge with designing incremental dispute settlement mechanisms across the different pillars is that there's not a whole lot of feedback mechanisms or evaluation that goes back to ASEAN centrality. The, at the political level, the rhetoric is good, but in terms of safeguarding that centrality, um, that's still a work in progress. But what it does well is to articulate so much of these normative ambitions. What it hasn't done well is building the infrastructure necessary to make sure within that we stay within the guardrails of meeting those ambitions for the peoples of ASEAN. Well put. Thank you so much, Diane. I'll, I'll look forward to coming back to some of these points in our subsequent discussion. I'm going to turn now uh, to Anderson DeRossi. Uh, who is speaking to us uh, on the basis of his experience uh, with the Inter-American Commission. Uh, he is currently, I believe, uh, a, at Harvard Law School. Is that right? 
Good to see you again, Anderson, and congrats on that. Uh, very much looking forward to, to hearing your, your views on uh, the inter-American system in the context of, of what we've heard already. Um, so uh, if, you, if you could take 10 minutes to uh, make sure that all, all the members of our audience are familiar with uh, the nature of the Inter-American Commission, its, its relation to the court, um, and, and ideally give us an opportunity to bring in, again, some of these different regional perspectives. Thank you, Anderson. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And, and thank you, everyone, for hosting this amazing panel. Uh, I will start saying that we have to change context. We're going now to the international human rights context and we're actually talking about friendly settlement of dispute in a, what I think it's already very institutionalized context because due to the nature of the, of the dispute in itself, which is a petition from an individual to the commission talking about a state that might have allegedly violated a human rights. We're not talking about mediation. We're talking about a situation where uh, both of the parties are not in the same position of power. So that, that will be the first thing. And then to understand how the inter-American system work, uh, it's also understanding the nature of the commission. The commission is a quasi-judicial body. So on the one hand, they have broadly political functions. They have to oversight the situation of the human rights in the region. They issue uh, press releases. They issue reports on thematic uh, issues. But they also have a very, we could say, uh, jurisdictional function, which is where they receive these individual petitions. And once they decide this petition on merits, depending on whether the state is part of the con contentious jurisdiction of the court, they will send these uh, cases to the court. This, this actually highlights that it's quite different from the European uh, court of Human Rights, because in the European Court of Human Rights, as many of you know, you have a direct access uh, after you, of course, uh, do all the internal the internal uh, remedies, but you don't have to go to what we have at the commission. So in that sense, the commission might be seen uh, on the one hand as a objective prosecutor, because it's the, it's the organ that will present the case before the court. But before it gets to present the case, it behaves as, as a first instance. So in that first instance is where this friendly settlement procedure happens. Once the commission is seized with an individual petition, as soon as it's already seized, it's, uh, all the parties have the opportunity to request and start uh, this process of friendly, of friendly settlement. And that's where the issue comes. And right now, the commission is dealing with a problem, which is the backlog. The commission is the first human rights body receiving individual petitions. And it might be probably the one dealing with, with, with the issue of backlog more badly. And one of the things is that we're not just talking about backlog in the cases, but also in the uh, friendly system mechanism. Because what we have is that some of the states might take even 20 years, according to the most recent annual uh, report of the commission to get to a friendly uh, settlement. So if they take 20 years to, to get to there, or let's say 15 years and they, they don't really reach an agreement, then they will still have to do all the contentious uh, procedure. In terms of regionalism, I will say that uh, as uh, Dr. Desierto was saying, in the, in the inter-American system, we have a difference in how states will engage depending on the language and their culture. We know that in the Caribbean, the English speaking Caribbean, Caribbean does not engage as much with the, with the commission. And in, in actually it's not part, many, most of the states are not actually part of the court. So the way that the friendly settlement mechanism will work as a deterrence for the state to go to the court uh, wouldn't work so much with the with the Caribbean states. So even within the Latin American and Caribbean region, we have like that big split, uh, which I think it would be relevant to know if we were to design another another dispute settlement mechanism. However, in comparison to all the other mechanisms that we're dealing today, I still think that the inter-American system is quite institutionalized. Uh, I think it still requires a lot for the for the victims in, ter in terms of time, 
And I don't think the results is actually very effective in terms of numbers. Like the commission reported that from 1985 to 2017, they approved a total of 137 uh, settlement agreements, which is, uh, let's say just this year, they issued 345 reports. Reports means uh, cases that actually were declared admissible or cases that were decided on the merits. So if we were analyze the universe of all the cases, we will say that this process is not as uh, effective in the in the whole uh, in the whole uh, context of the decision in cases within the commission. I must say that in 2020, the commission approved the resolution uh, number three in in an effort to kind of deal with the backlog within the friendly system settlement mechanism within the commission, acknowledging that they had to establish deadlines. Because on the one hand, you wanted the states and the parties to make sure they will reach an agreement and you will give them time and time and time. But the commission say, hey, at the end of the day, what we want is solutions for the victims. And if we let them uh, actually take as much time as they need, they might just use the, the friendly settlement mechanism as an obstruction to actually getting a decision from the commission or ultimately from the court. I think there is a lot to learn, but in general, one of the problems for the inter-American system is access to justice, how we can provide a timely access to justice to, to the victims. And I don't think the, the mechanism is fulfilling that role. It is true though, that under certain particular context and individual cases that a state is very willing and is very cognizant of the of the situation, uh, it might reach a decision after it's already internationalized. But the problem with that is that usually, if a state is really in a position to comply with the international obligations, probably these cases will be will be have uh, already a solution domestically, and they wouldn't wait for the involvement of the International Commission on Human Rights. So that will be the introduction, and please, Brian, uh, your questions. Thank you very much, Anderson. Quite quite interesting, and um, again, uh, I would say kind of a, a sober assessment of the the questionable effectiveness of certain aspects of this system. Um, a measured assessment, but but your concern is clear with regard to certain um, you know fundamental concerns like access to justice. Um, just just to clarify here, in in your view, again, in the spirit of regional comparison, the um, cousin of the commission over in Europe was abolished some decades ago. Uh, what is it about the Latin American experience or the inter-American system uh, which necessitated or militated toward maintaining uh, the commission in this system which, where, wherein it, it seems to have uh, lost its function or perceived value across the ocean? Well, the thing is that the commission has important political uh, functions and I think most of us, even the most critical uh, academics, we all agree that it's an important uh, role. What for me, it's something that we might have to revisit is the way the commission actually engages with the more, uh, let's say, judi judi jurisdictional function, because still the commission uh, does in, in local, which is like in the place visit, the commission meets with governments. The commission have like a very good way from the political part of actually uh, promoting human rights. But from the from this petition system, what we have is that actually the court usually deals with most of the cases and it's the commission that actually is with the, with the backlog. So it's the commission actually stopping the access to justice to the, to the inter-American system. And the other thing that we might not be able to compare with the European court is that we only have a few judges in the inter-American system then you don't really have that capability of dealing with so many cases as the European uh, Court of Human Rights. So for me, it will require actually changing the structure of the court first, if you will give uh, direct access to all the states. And that I think what is happening in the region is that we're not in a situation where the states will be willing to engage in any kind of uh, restructuring at this point. Because as you know, we, we probably are in a position of we better take what we have now, because if we open the door for changes, we might very well not end with something that will be good for, for the development of human rights. 
Thanks, Anderson. Uh, in returning to to again with a regional perspective, Diane's earlier comments um, and 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 you know the reliance in the Southeast Asian region on uh, non judicial settlement of um, uh, disputes. Uh, I'm I'm curious whether you know you you seem to have painted the relationship between the commission and the court as a complementary one, perhaps even suggesting the necessity of judicial settlement. Well, what about her point with respect to language here, or or one might also say um, legal tradition? Uh, does does the fact that Spanish is the lingua franca here in this region of the world, does the fact that it's uh, a colonial legacy which has provided relative uniformity in legal traditions across borders, do, does does that le lend itself to the creation of international courts, as has been suggested? In, in your view, does the inter-American experience suggest that? Well, I think your your question is very relevant, but I must must say it doesn't really have an effect on uh, dispute settlement in this context because dispute settlement is between, of course, a national and probably the state in the way that is practiced in the in the inter-American system. So it wouldn't be relevant in that context. But broadly, that's certainly an issue within the the inter-American system. And it's the way that states with a common law tradition in the region will relate to the to the inter-American system. It's very different, um, which is also interesting in a way because Brazil, they have Portuguese and they are very well uh, enshrined in the system, I suppose. So I will say it's not it's not exactly the language, but the, the, the tradition, particularly the legal tradition is very relevant. Uh, common law countries are way more uh, let's say distrustful of the of the whole system, and it's not even Canada and the United States. It's it goes to all the common the common law countries in the Caribbean as well. So it's it's one of the missions of the of the commission. They just elected now. Uh, they have two members of the commission from from one from Barbados and the other one from uh, Jamaica. So they're really pushing forward to connect better with the with the common with the common law system and of course with the countries in the Caribbean. Thanks so much, Anderson. I'm I'm glad I asked a provocative question that was uh, a fulfilling answer and 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 illuminating with respect to the experience of the Caribbean nations, um, with which I know you're very familiar. So uh, let's turn now before we go plenary, and, and I'll take this opportunity to remind our guests, our audience members, to please um, enter questions in the chat um, so that it's not simply me asking everything that I want. Um, I see that some of you have already started to do so. Uh, we're going to turn now to our, our last speaker, Tara Davenport. Uh, Tara is uh, joining us from uh, late at Thanks. night, I assume. Mm -hmm. Uh, she is a deputy director of the Asia Pacific Center for Environmental Law at the National University of Singapore, an assistant professor at that law faculty, uh, and a senior research fellow at the Center for International Law, uh, holding degrees from LSC um, and US as well as Yale Law School. So thank you so much, Tara, for joining us on um, a specific area of your expertise. The, the skeletal remarks that we covered in preparation for this are headed Timor Leste Australia conciliation under the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, so, so please take take some time now to make sure we're all up to speed on how this process went a few years ago. What is its uh, historical contextual significance? And and as you might expect, my interest is: does this mean anything for other systems? Can we learn from this? Thank you. Great. Um, thank you very much, Brian. And again, thank you to the organizers for this uh, opportunity to participate in this panel with these distinguished panelists. Um, I am here to talk about UNCLOS conciliation. And I think it would be useful to start off with sort of, a, I'm sure everyone knows um, about conciliation, but a traditional definition of conciliation, which is a method for the settlement of international disputes of any nature, according to which a commission set up by the parties proceeds to the impartial examination of the dispute and attempts to define the terms of a settlement susceptible of being accepted by them or affording the parties with a view to its settlement such aid as they may have requested. So the Law of the Sea Convention, um, we commonly call it the Constitution for the Oceans. Uh, it governs state activities in the oceans. And it is one of the, I think, very few 
uh, international conventions which have a robust dispute treaty mechanism, a dispute settlement uh, mechanism, uh, which is found in part 15 of the Law of the Sea Convention, and it provides a smorgasbord of both compulsory and non-compulsory dispute settlement um, uh, uh, mechanisms. Um, I think while the negotiators of UNCLOS always intended that the dispute settlement procedures would include conciliation, it was only later in the negotiations that the idea of a compulsory non-binding conciliation, which could be triggered by one party without first obtaining specific consent from the other party emerged. And again, this lies in the debate between the maritime powers who pushed for compulsory and binding arbitral or adjudication procedures and other states that were opposed to the idea of having the International Court of Justice or an arbitral tribunal adjudicating disputes concerning sovereignty and sovereign rights, which were considered to be particularly sensitive. In the end, a compromise solution was come up with, uh, was devised, and um, uh, it was generally agreed that disputes concerning the interpretation or application of the law of the sea Con convention would generally be subject to compulsory dispute settlement procedures entailing binding decisions by either the International Court of Justice, a newly established court, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, or an arbitral tribunal, which we call an Annex 7 arbitral tribunal. However, states would have the option to exclude from these compulsory binding dispute settlement procedures certain categories of dispute that were linked to the exercise of sovereign rights or exclusive jurisdiction. These disputes would be the subject to compulsory non-binding conciliation. So again, this is quite unique. While the conciliation process would be compulsory and parties were obliged to submit to it, they would still retain some control over the outcome in the form of a non-binding report, which they in principle did not have to comply with. Um, and again, they, the negotiators in UNCLOS, they were inspired by the 1969 Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which provided for both binding adjudication as well as non-binding conciliation. And the VLCT was actually inspired by the Convention on the Settlement of Investment Disputes and the African Union Charter, that only certain types of disputes should be referred to adjudication and arbitration and everything else to compulsory non-binding conciliation. Therefore, you have this uh, provision in the Law of the Sea Convention, uh, Article 298, right? So again, remember the default position is that all disputes relating to the um, interpretation or application of the Law of the Sea Convention, including disputes relating to maritime boundaries, would be subject to compulsory binding procedures. However, states were allowed to opt out, uh, either when they ratify the Law of the Sea Convention or thereafter, to exclude such disputes, maritime boundaries limitation disputes, from compulsory binding procedures and subject these disputes to non-binding conciliation procedures. However, there were certain conditions that you had to meet under Article 298. The dispute had to arise subsequent to the entry into force of UNCLOS. The parties must have shown that they could not negotiate an agreement within a reasonable period of time, and that disputes did not involve the concurrent consideration of any unsettled dispute concerning sovereignty or other rights over continental or insular land territory. Uh, the, the Australia Timor-Leste conciliation was really the first example, uh, first and only example so far of the compulsory conciliation being used. Um, and again, I do have to, uh, it, you know, we don't have time to go into the very long series of events that led to Timor-Leste triggering this, but it basically a, a, um, has arisen out of a dispute over resources in the Timor Sea. Uh, and a inability of the parties to agree on a maritime boundary. Um, and there were series of arrangements after Timor-Leste became independent in 2002 uh, between Australia and Timor-Leste relating to the sharing or the arrangements in the Timor Sea relating to these resources. One of these agreements, a certain maritime arrangements um, treaties, actually um, excluded the possibility of maritime boundaries being negotiated, right? And they rather discussed how oil and gas reserves from Greater Sunrise would be divided. The Timor-Leste wanted to negotiate maritime boundaries, but Australia declined. Um, and this is why really Timor-Leste felt as if they had no choice to, but to initiate these compulsory conciliation proceedings against Australia. Uh, the procedure was set out in Annex 5 of UNCLOS. Uh, there was an objection to the competence of the commission uh, on several uh, grounds, which we can talk about later. 
ultimately, the Conciliation Commission found that it was, um, uh, they had the competence to decide the dispute. There were several rounds of meetings and negotiations um, uh, between all the parties, and I can get into that a little bit later. And ultimately, uh, Australia and Timor Leste were able to agree upon a maritime boundary agreement. Uh, the Conciliation Commission issued a report, um, and uh, there was some uh, suggestions in the report about the sharing of resources in the uh, Timor Sea. Um, so the fact that they were able to actually agree on a maritime boundary, I would say is a great success because the conditions between Timor Leste and Australia were actually very uh, tense. There was a lot of distrust between them. Timor Leste actually brought a, a claim, uh, initiated proceedings against Australia for espionage. Um, and there were several arbitral proceedings against Australia by Timor Leste. So there was really trust was at an all time low. So I think the fact that they were able to agree on this maritime boundary after really several you know, years and years of uh, discussion on it um, uh, was really um, a very important victory. Uh, in relation to your question about the success, or I guess what lessons or effectiveness um, in relation to the UNCLOS conciliation that we can learn from, um, I think there are a few things that I would like to highlight and then I'll stop. Um, first is that the commission took steps to establish a non-adversarial and informal atmosphere. They did not ask for written memorials or formal submissions. Uh, any materials submitted were termed as non-papers, working papers or equivalent. They asked to meet separately with each party for informal exploration of issues, particularly in the beginning. They asked the parties to keep the delegation small to facilitate discussion with the commission. The meetings were informal and confidential with no written records. They kept regular channels of communication open through emails and text messages. They arranged social meetings to increase touch, trust and engagement. Um, individual commission members met with leaders of each country, right? So these steps would not have been possible in an arbitral or judicial proceeding, right? Which very much frowns upon ex parte um, communications between the tribunal and the uh, parties. Um, that's the first issue, the non sort of adversarial nature of the proceedings. Secondly, I think the, during the conciliation process, the Commission proposed a package of confidence building measures, which included action by both Timor Leste and Australia to demonstrate each party's commitment to the conciliation process, including termination of the um, certain maritime arrangements treaty, as well as the suspension of two arbitral proceedings that Timor Leste had against Australia. The commission had a much wider latitude uh, to be able to take into account non-legal interests, which arbitration or judicial proceedings are not able to. The commission was able to engage with non-state actors, non-state corporate actors, such as the Greater Sunrise Joint Venture, right, which were critical uh, in uh, the, jo the joint development aspect of the arrangements. And again, and I think really the key thing is the members of the commission were themselves, several of them, particularly the chair, were skilled diplomats, as well as international lawyers. And I think this played a very um, huge and significant role in the success of the proceedings. And this is something which has been acknowledged by all parties. So I think I'll, I'll stop there. Hopefully that's given you enough um, background. Quite a bit, Tara. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your, your views on that. Maybe, maybe having heard this, um, this funny thing called unclosed conciliation is not so much of a unicorn, despite the fact that <laughs> the very idea of this compulsory yet allegedly amicable process is, is a bit strange. You've showed us that it was envisaged from an early point in the uh, at the third conference in the drafting of the convention. But the sole experience that we have here seems to flip some assumptions on its head rather than, as we've discussed earlier today, these kinds of amicable processes being sufficient or being a step before possibly going to judicial settlement, we have here essentially Timor Leste instituting this unused procedure uh, because it could not get what it wanted through judicial settlement, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and and I'm curious because you you you've emphasized the informal nature of this right down to every detail. These are non-papers, but. If I recall, there were objections to jurisdiction in this amicable process, and I, I believe they were heard in camera. So what is your view on, on how that was handled? 
Yes, um, I, I think that's a very interesting point. Uh, the law, the C Convention in Annex 5, does allow objections to, to the competence of the commission to be made. And I believe, I believe the exit conciliation process also allows that, uh, but I could be wrong. Um, and it is true that the competence objection mirrors more traditional dispute settlement mechanisms, you know, which have, of course, jurisdictional objection phases. And again, I think the commission itself also acknowledged that the objection to the competence of the commission was of an unavoidably adversarial character of a challenger competent and which had done little to foster trust and confidence between the parties. So, you know, it sort of, um, I guess, started things off in a, a note that they did not want to start off on. Um, however, I do think that it was a, an essential step for Australia to be able to engage effectively in the conciliation afterwards, I think to assure itself and its domestic constituencies that you know, these experts um, had made a binding decision on whether the requirements of Article 298 have been met and whether the Conciliation Commission had been properly constituted. Uh, and I think having a, a reasoned legal argument, they issued a, uh, a decision on competence and that was publicly available. Um, and I think that laid the groundwork for, groundwork for the more important part of the conciliation process to take place. And I think it really enhanced actually the, uh, the conciliation process in general. You're muted, sorry. <laughs> I made it an hour, okay. Uh, thank <laughs> you very much. I, I, I wanted to note as well, I found interesting um, this comment that you've made about what seems to be a certain openness to third party participation, which might be endemic to this process, the participation of the, the Greater Sunrise entity, for example, in Timor-Leste Australia. Um, and, and that might be seen as more open than third party participation in mm -hmm. interstate judicial and arbitral constructs, which is a timely uh, a timely uh, point. But I want to, before we open it up, I want to get your view on something because you've, you've emphasized, uh, Tara, that, that, that these two states were at loggerheads, uh, espionage, uh, many instances of uh, arbitration and litigation against each other, um, and, and uh, some antipathy uh, and conflict going back decades. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, they were able to come together and 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 agree to this report that had been adopted by the commission. And so we're one for one, right? We have one example here and it was a success. And I'm really reluctant to draw too much mm -hmm. from that. I, at the end of the day, this is these are boundary conciliations. So we're always going to be talking about neighboring states essentially. They they owe it to themselves to get along. But I'm curious as to whether we think that this is really something that can be expected on the whole. And if you're anything less than certain that this is the path, then, then how do you read this extremely complex provision in Article 298 that you've mentioned, Article 298, paragraph 1, sub A, sub 2, which says that in that situation, the parties, quote, shall, by mutual consent, submit the question to adjudication or arbitration, shall by mutual consent. What the heck should we understand from that? And, and, and is this something that we can expect to succeed um, elsewhere? Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Brian. I think um, maybe I will, before answering the last question, maybe I will just elaborate a little bit about whether I think it can be repeated. Um, is it a unicorn? Uh, you know, ask me in 20 years, right? Um, I mean, I do, I do think there were certain exceptional factors that were at play, but I think there were are still important lessons and, um, you know, the relatively successful outcome, I think will go some way to encouraging other states to attempt conciliation. I think the major problem, uh, you know, uh, Diane alluded to it um, in, the, in, in our region in Southeast Asia, uh, firstly, the, the requirements in Article 298, which required that the dispute um, have a, should have arisen after the entry into force of UNCLOS, which is in 1994, and which requires that it, it should not involve sovereignty disputes. Um, the majority of our disputes in Southeast Asia, uh, you know, including the South China Sea disputes, have been going on for a very long time, and they also involve, um, uh, you know, sovereignty disputes. So, I mean, of course, creative lawyering may be able to uh, get around this, but um, I, you know, it, it, compulsory conciliation in my part of the world may 
not be um, as utilized. Although, of course, parties are always welcome to use voluntary conciliation and UNCLOS also provides for that. Um, I think in many ways, conciliation proceedings and UNCLOS, uh, sorry, for law, the sea disputes, uh, in many ways, are, it's, are very suitable, right? And it's because of the ambiguity, um, I would say, of certain law of the sea provisions, coupled with the interests at stake in relation to maritime resources and sovereignty. And they make conciliation maybe perhaps more suitable for law of the sea disputes because you have a binary, sorry, with the judicial and arbitral proceedings, you have binary win-lose outcomes, right? Whereas with conciliation, you can avoid giving these binding legal interpretations, which reduce states' flexibility. And um, I mean, I hate to compare this to the South China Sea arbitration, but of course, um, uh, as we know, China has, has not complied with that. Um, uh, the question on the Article 298, the, again, one of the, uh, you know, sort of uh, deliberate ambiguities of the Law of the Sea Convention, um, I think, uh, right, the, the question is, if there is no agreement between the parties on the basis of the report, are the parties then required to submit to compulsory dispute settlement procedures? Because in Article 298, it says they sh parties shall, by mutual consent, submit the question to uh, the procedures in Section 2. I, um, I, I do think the drafting creates some uncertainty, um, you know, and again, this was the result of the, you know, the political bargains that were made in UNCLOS, right? The, uh, there were two opposing camps uh, which disagreed on whether if the conciliation failed, should one party be able to unilaterally utilize compulsory dispute settlement mechanisms. However, I do think that there is a strong argument that can be made that if the parties do not reach agreement on the basis of the conciliation report, they can only resort to compulsory procedures if they both agree. And there is a provision in the Law of the Sea Convention, I've actually never noticed it until recently, uh, Article 299, which states that such disputes um, may only be submitted to such procedures only by agreement of the parties to the dispute. Um, so again, I think that's, uh, I, I would take that position. And I would also, my final point would be that, to say that I think a conciliation report, particularly one that is a result of sustained engagement with the relevant stakeholders, that is well-reasoned, will have a higher likelihood of forming the basis for negotiations between the parties. And I'll stop there. Well said, thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at the chat box here, we have 15 minutes um, and I see uh, our good friend, Vlad Lanovoy, uh, has been very active. Um, and, and any of the other uh, 20 or 30 of you who are watching, please feel free to enter a question. But I'm going to start with uh, his his second question here. Thank you very much, Vlad, uh, which uh, Diane has in her free time during this panel already uh, responded to. So I know you have some thoughts on it, but it links as well to what Tara said. And I want to give an opportunity for all our speakers to touch base here. So Vlad asks, to what extent do diplomatic forms of dispute settlement, could they eventually be more open to bringing in stakeholders other than states, in particular corporate actors, indigenous communities, et cetera, that may have a direct interest in the outcome of a dispute? And he refers specifically to Timor Leste Australia conciliation procedure. Tara has already, as fate would have it, remarked upon the participation of third entities in that process. Um, and, and Diane, thanks, thanks for shouting out to Tara's uh, um, uh, intervention in that respect. Um, you've noted as well other examples of successful multi-party dispute settlement under bespoke provisions such as the Bangladesh Accord arbitrations uh, arising from the Rana Plaza tragedy uh, that reportedly had simultaneous negotiations taking place under ILO Bangladesh auspices, even while there was arbitration administered by the PCA. I'm glad that you brought up um, the Rana Plaza um, or the Bangladesh Accords. Um, that's another, uh, as you put it, bespoke process, which which seems quite unique and which I, I think we can say was not entirely transparent and perhaps is not entirely intended to be transparent. Di Diane, do you, do you have any thoughts on how we should, in the context of our discussion today, understand something like the Bangladesh Accords and the and the unique dynamics that, that have um have been used in that in that arrangement. Thank you, Brian, and and thank you, Tara, indeed, for the comprehensive discussion on the conciliation procedure, and Anderson for the discussion on friendly settlements. I do want to make one important clarification, probably for those who are watching, but also for those who will watch this webinar. 
And it's in how we understand and characterize the nature of a dispute. When we think of disputes, we're not talking of a monolithic conception of a dispute, how a party vis-a-vis -vis the other party versus external constituencies may view disputes in a very different manner. So in the example of the South China Sea arbitration, if you think of the dispute as being the longstanding resolution of the territorial and maritime boundary claims, then it, that does not resolve the dispute. But that arbitration was not intended to resolve that particular dispute. If you follow the characterization and probably my full disclosure is I did have some hand in, in that particular characterization of that dispute. The dispute involved the particular use and, com and consistency of the nine dash line map that China kept using for purposes of future negotiations involving um, their territorial and maritime claims. And having binding adjudication that declares the legal and if not, and, and in many senses, the illegal nature or inconsistency of that map with the limits provided for under the Convention on the Law of the Sea is a reinforcement and a settlement of that particular narrow dispute. But I fully conclude it was never, I fully agree, concur, was never intended to resolve the full compass of the political dispute. And this is why I think it's important to differentiate between what dispute it is that we are seeking to resolve as we start doing jurisdictional planning and start trying to design the dispute resolution process. The Bangladesh Accord arbitrations were particularly unique because the, the dispute was very much centered on employment relations, on tort actions, on tort claims arising from an employer-employee relationship involving particular allegations involving negligence by regulators, by Bangladesh, as well as in its relations relations and upholding labor standards insofar as the garments industry was concerned. Did that need the full transparency in that particular instance? The unions themselves did not want full transparency and openness of the dispute resolution procedure as the claimants, as the victims in that particular tragedy. So. Why do I say this? Because I do think that there is so much room within the construct and within the legal imaginaries of international lawyers to extricate themselves from the compartments that we have already been given in terms of the modalities of dispute settlement and begin from step one and think about who the parties are in the particular instance and what are the interests here that do have to be resolved and what is the dispute to which we can lend our best efforts and strategies, as well as our ethics in understanding how to use dispute resolution in a way that advances human rights claimants, situations in Latin America friendly settlement where you've got repeat users of a system or employment claims in respect to the UN administrative tribunal. Those are all very discreet. And so to the extent, I think we have it backwards. We have to begin with the parties to these array of disputes. Then we have to strategically as well as ethically and transparently work together in this invisible college to think of how to contribute to peacemaking in that context of an array of disputes. Then we start talking about designing the process. It's just, unfortunately, I see far too many international dispute resolution textbooks that focus on here are the mechanisms without looking at what's the dispute and how are we supposed to diagnose problem solving in this context? Thank you very much, Diane. Uh, very well put. And um, I want to see if anyone wants to jump in. I'm, I'm glad that you drew the connection to Mushek's uh, presentation as well. Um, drawing that line between the otherwise quite unique Bangladesh model uh, based on tort claims in an employer-employee relationship and the UN mediation system that we've just heard about. So if anyone wants to, to follow up on what we've just heard from Diane, um, speak now or forever hold your peace. Otherwise, I'll pop in with another question. I might, I might just say something uh, to to the first comment of Professor Diane when she was mentioning about uh, how do we define uh, dispute. And for me, I think it's relevant if we are having this panel to kind of think what are good practices and we, if, we, if any of us have the chance of practicing uh, in designing 
uh, dispute settlement mechanism, I think we also have to think of who are the actors engaging in this system. Because my one of my conclusions from this panel is that it might very well differ in the context of international human rights law, the level of engagement that you might have from the third party, from the mediator, from the from the from the institution. So that would be very relevant, because I don't think, I, for in the context of international human rights law, I don't think we can give so much deference to the state, because of the particular situation. Of course, we have victims and and we have the state, so. I guess my conclusion is we we might not take all these dispute settlement or alternative dispute settlement mechanism from the same lenses. We have like to be mindful of those differences in the context. Thank you so much for your input, Anderson. Um, I want to turn as well to uh, to Tara and Mushak if if you if you have any input on the kind of place that we've ended up now with five minutes left, where we're, we're looking at these proceedings, um, both beyond the courts, beyond the usual suspects, and we're thinking about what is it that we want in the courts and the tribunals that we build tomorrow? What is it that we want in the dispute settlement systems, whether or not they have courts and tribunals? Um, ultimately, we want disputes resolved. We want them resolved fairly, ideally efficiently. Uh, and, and so when we talk about questions of fair treatment and as noted earlier, access to justice and these kinds of you know, sacrosanct ideas that we would expect to be valued in any international dispute settlement system that the world comes together to create, what have we learned from our discussion of any of these four systems that we've covered today? Do these kinds of prece proceedings resolve the kinds of questions that come up when we're talking about building courts? Do amicable, quote unquote, amicable dispute settlement systems, such as those that we've covered today, um, lead, lead to a higher likelihood of fair treatment, lead to a higher likelihood of predictability, a higher likelihood of transparency, and whatever values that, that we think might be um, ideally um, infused into whatever international courts or international dispute settlement systems that we build from this point forward. So if, if, if Tara Mushak or, or as well, Diane or Anderson, if you have any points that you want to add here in closing on, on how we can kind of holistically assess this in that light. Tara, you want to go first? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah then, then I can, I can, I can speak to no wrong answers. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so, so one thing that is really important for me as a takeaway, whatever you're doing, wh whatever the system you're designing here, I think in, in light of what uh, late Frank Sanders was um, you know, speaking about, you know, this system design, I think the multi-system multi or multi, multi court uh, programs are, are the ideal way to go. And I think in that context, when you're designing um, a dispute system, um, and in, in that context, it's really important to give the opportunity to the parties to choose the process that is best fit for their dispute. And in that context, your system should allow that those options um, and it should be, it should be able to provide um, all options possible, whether it's conciliation, mediation, arbitration, litigation. Of course, it's costly to have everything in place, but I think at the bare minimum, if you can allow some sort of adjudication along with some sort of a self-determined system, whether it's conciliation or mediation, that will be ideal to me. And I think that's what the future holds in terms of the dispute system design. Thanks very much, Moshe. Tara, change of heart? <laughs> no, I, I, I really hope that I, I didn't... Um... I, I didn't suggest or overstate, uh, you know, conciliation replace all uh, compulsory binding dispute settlement. I don't mean to suggest that at all. Um, and I, I also must do a shout out for the Law of the Sea Convention because it does, as Mosheg was saying, provide a smorgasbord of different dispute settlement options that may suit different disputes. Um, and I do think that, um, you know, states tend to be more comfortable in sort of the adversarial you know, uh, situations. Um, and I think that's, you know, again, not many states have used conciliation or even mediation. Um, they prefer to have this sort of uh, binding outcome. 
uh, which they can also use vis-a-vis -vis their uh, consistency. So I don't think, I don't in any way want to downplay the importance of uh, binding dispute resolution. I do think it has a very important role to play. Um, and as particular, uh, as Diane said, um, uh, for the South China Sea arbitration, uh, it, it was very significant, right? And not about resolving the dispute, but about clarifying the claims, giving um, uh, parties leverage um, against each other. So um, I, I do think that these systems need to ex exist side by side and would echo Mushek's point. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Tara, for, for ending us on that note of, of complementarity, um, which mm -hmm. returns us to the description that, uh, that Philip authored for this, this, co this conversation, which brings us to Article 33 of the Charter and reminds us that even judicial, even arbitral settlement are peaceful alternatives to um, what we had before um, and what we still have, unfortunately, today. Uh, and so by that standard, everything that we've covered is, quote, friendly settlement. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to see if Philip has any final words to, to add here as we check out on time. Well, nothing further from me. I'd just like to thank you, Brian, and to all of the panelists for a really fascinating discussion. I think we've covered a lot of ground and both practical and on a theoretical level has given us a lot of food for thought. So thanks to you and to the audience for joining. Thanks very much. Thank you. Great to meet all of you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, thank you. you so much.